Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. We've been running a series of what we call 10 minute explainers, where we take an issue that is kind of puzzling and we ask somebody who really knows an awful lot about it to explain why it's happening, what it is and uh, where it's going. And our topic for today is the mysterious world of, of crypto exchanges. Why the hell are they so profitable? I note from a very cursory look at the FT that um, what well, Coinbase's second quarter net income was $1.6 billion, up from $32 million year on year. Binance on track for but over a billion dollars. FTX in Hong Kong has gone up from $77 million last year to $400 million this year. And FTX is now valued at $19 billion. I, the madness of this is, well, you know, I'm old, so I think all of this stuff is kind of mad. I also read in the FT this morning that uh, there's a wonderful article on Flocky. Flocky being, uh, if you miss Dogecoin, um, get Flocky. It's all over the London Underground. I saw it and I couldn't understand what the hell it was all about. It, it's something to do uh, with Elon Musk's dog. Um, but other than that, it seems to me to be, and I use the word cautiously and advisedly, a scam. But nonetheless, a lot of people are, are in it. Now, why, why on earth are exchanges as profitable as they are? Our expert for today is Eva Zale, uh, the currencies correspondent at the FT for the last three years. Before that, she was the editor of FX Week, and before that, she was a reporter for Dow Jones. She has tweeted endlessly on currencies in general. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what your views on, current, on the crypto exchanges. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for the kind introduction. And um, I mean, for starters, um, FTX's value has now gone up to 26 billion, 25 billion, sorry, um, as of last year. Um, where they did a funding round um, and a an exchange that was last February worth one billion is now uh, valued at twenty five billion dollars. Um, so this has changed in in just a month, pretty much. Um, that it's gone from well, sorry, two months. It's gone from nineteen billion to twenty five, which uh, seems pretty. Uh, chunky, I guess. It's a lot of money um, for, for a company that wasn't around um, three years ago. It was established in 2019. Um, but it's one of the, I guess that's one of the reasons why we're doing this is um, these are companies that uh, are very young, um, a few years old, and incredibly valuable uh, as of now, <laughs> after the last uh, sort of 18 months that has seen cryptocurrency prices go absolutely crazy. Um, and um, to answer the question of why uh, these exchanges are making so much money, um, I guess on the surface of it, it's pretty simple at this point. It's a, it's a rising market. It's a, a market that's going up. It's attracting people from all walks of life. Um, and um, it means rising volumes. So volumes have gone up. They've absolutely skyrocketed uh, compared with last year. Um, and that's one of the reasons. The second reason is they're able to charge pretty high fees. Um, in traditional markets, you know, equities and, and foreign exchange, um, trading revenues are not necessarily the bulk of uh, overall profits. Uh, so this, in this case, it's a young market. Trading revenues are still very much the what are the, um, what are the margins butter. what are the margins do you have a sense um so crypto exchanges generally charge between two and five basis points um so if you think of trillions of uh, dollars uh, worth of uh, volumes you suddenly get to a very large number um there are questions about some questions about where that how real those flows are and it's very difficult uh, to get a, a good sense of that because obviously um, it's a market that started with retail. Um, so the bulk of those of the flows in the market today is still from retail. Um, they're very happy to pay these high fees um, because the returns are potentially silly. There are many, many people who, you know, uh, lost lots of money on crypto, um, but the stories about the gardener buying a house in Antigua 
it's just too attractive um, for many people. And it's been going on for a while. You know, people have been expecting a price crash and the whole crypto space to just collapse and implode for, for a while. And it just keeps going up, you know, with the ETF, um, the futures-based ETFs uh, last week um, that pushed Bitcoin up to $67,000. Um, that was actually on the 10-year anniversary of Bitcoin's all-time low, which was $2.2. So the 23rd of, I think it was the 23rd of October, possibly the 21st, um, in 2011, what uh, Bitcoin was worth, $2.2. Was, I have to say, that was, I think, about the time that we first heard of Bitcoin. Somebody at a, a CSFI roundtable said, you can buy a Bitcoin, you can buy a coffee with a Bitcoin. You could buy an awful lot of coffees now with a Bitcoin. Are you, are you bullish on cryptos? I, I think that it's a space that's not going to go away. Um, I really think that it's, I don't, I honestly can't tell you. Um, I don't want to take a position whether it's worth anything or everything or nothing. You know, um, I think that um, the, the amount of money that's gone into it from now institutional investors um, means that it's, going, it's very unlikely that it will just disappear. Um, and, and, you know, in a year's time, we won't be talking about Bitcoin. I think uh, the market as it is, is, is incredibly exciting from my perspective, because it's a, it's a young market. It's full of, you know, scams, but also some really cool, exciting stuff um, that's really great to cover. So, right. But you, you say that institutional investors are now in it. In, institutional investors are not 15 year olds. They tend to be 45 year olds and they have Wharton MBAs. Why are they not driving down the margins? Well, I guess it's 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 got to a stage where we're in a stage yet where people are, um, and it's one of the risks for the exchanges um, that people seem to sort of move towards the rather than trading it, it's more of an asset that you hold, you buy and hold, and so you've got the sort of hope of it will go up and I'll be you know able to make all this money. Also, as an institutional investor, so if you look at what hedge funds are doing. Um, but also there is um, a huge amount of opportunity um, because of arbitrage, because of the, the, the way the market is so young, is just not efficient enough. Like we saw uh, last week with the ETFs um, that basically created a lovely trade for people, um, which could double digit percentage returns. Um, and one of the reasons why that trade is, hasn't gone away is because uh, on the CME, crypto margins are higher. People don't want to put in, you know, all that capital. There are fewer larger players. So yes, there is institutional money going into it, but it's not uh, it's not an efficient market at this point. Hmm. Do you anticipate that margins will come down? I mean, it does seem as though you know Coinbase and FTX are making kind of super profits at the present time, partly because of the ignorance of the investors. I mean, isn't is that a, an issue? I mean, they've come down in equity markets, the spreads. Well, I think it's very much an issue. Um, and it's something that they're looking at, you know, exchanges, what can they do to, to replace those revenues from, from those trading revenues? Because um, there will be a point uh, where the new in entrance to the market will just, the number of that will just taper off. Um, people don't necessarily want to, um, you know, sell their Bitcoins, they want to uh, hold it and, and see what happens. Um, so that will put pressure on their um, margins. On the other hand, they do have an almost unlimited number of products. So, uh, you know, you have, uh, we've seen at attempts, um, you know, at creating, becoming wallet providers, uh, moving towards NFTs. Um, you mentioned Flocky, um, you know, we could come up with a coin tomorrow and um, probably list it on one of the exchanges. And, um, you know, that's a new product for, for that particular exchange. Yeah, the FT could have a pink coin. It would be very appropriate and then split, split the profits amongst all of you. What about, the, uh, what about the regulators? Are they showing an interest? Gary Gensler, for instance, I mean, he's always been a Bitcoin skeptic. Doesn't he kind of notice and worry about what's going on in the exchanges space? I'm sure he does. I mean, you know, I, I think it's very difficult not to notice. Um, but also at the same time, we see traditional exchanges now opening up digital arms. Uh, so it doesn't seem like, uh, 
I don't think regulators will come in and say, guys, we're shutting you down. It's just not going to happen. Um, you know, I don't think it's, um, it's too big. It's too profitable. Uh, so what will likely happen is that regula regulatory costs will go up for exchanges as they try to sort of become more legitimate and more, you know, traditional in their setups. Um, the F FTX, for example, has moved from Hong Kong to the Bahamas. Um, so, you know, there are many of these um, uh, uh, moves. Uh, there's also decentralized finance, which is completely uh, a wild west at the moment. And many exchanges have some sort of a, an arm or an involvement in that space. So regulatory costs will go up. Um, uh, I think that's almost a certainty. Uh, they will have to do a lot more uh, to satisfy regulators um, that they are doing the right thing. Um, but I think it's going to be a, a long process because, you know, DeFi, it's moving so fast and regulators tend to move at a much slower pace. Moving from Hong Kong to, to the Bahamas, however, is not the kind of move that regulators really like to see, do they? Well, I mean, at this point, I think regulators are struggling with, um, you know, they have to figure out the basics, like who is regulating this space? What is this inst instrument? You know, um, is it a security? Is it a commodity? Is mm -hmm. it property? Um, so I think regulators have a, a quite a few questions uh, that they need to tackle first. And, and you, on the exchanges side, they can look at, you know, AML, KYC, in the UK here, there was a bit of a kerfuffle between the FCA and Binance um, about, you know, whether they're able to regulate them or not, or have some sort of um, supervision over them. Um, and so these sort of issues are pretty big and they're pretty global because many of these exchanges um, are in the cloud, if you like. So they're very much a global um, headquarterless entity in in some cases and that's very hard i think to to regulate in the cloud and therefore regulated by god or you know someone <laughs> on that happy note uh, i'm uh, i'm like you know i'm skeptical about them but obviously you know i'm too old to have a view really uh, eva is much less skeptical than me i guess she really feels there's something solid behind it uh, i hope she's right for the sake of the global financial system can i thank eva jale can i thank all of you for watching many thanks thank you